right, thank you very much for the song service. And uh, now, if you like, let's go to the book of Zechariah. That's Old Testament, Zechariah. And in chapter 4, now, to find Zechariah, if you know where the Gospel of Matthew is, uh, the book prior to that, which is the last book of the Old Testament, is Malachi. The book before that is Zechariah. So, <coughs> as we've been studying and noting, we've been talking about the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, specifically in verse 49 where Jesus, after his resurrection and just prior to his ascension, actually gave an instruction to the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they received power from on high. That then took us into the study of Acts chapter 1 and 2, where we're talking about, again, Jesus giving the promise once again in Acts chapter 1, and then the fulfillment of that prophecy in chapter 2, specifically in verse 4, when the disciples, apostles, were filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. Jesus Christ called this power from on high. In Acts chapter 1, he called it the baptism of God the Holy Spirit. We also know this to be the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And then we recognize on, in uh, chapter 2, verse 4, they were then filled with God the Holy Spirit. And so we've noted all those doctrines. We've noted the understanding of what it means to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, where we are placed in union with Jesus Christ. We are one with Christ. We know what it means to be indwelt. He lives within us. We are the temple of God. And the filling of God the Holy Spirit is His empowering, enabling ministry for us each and every day. And what was interesting about this is that on the day of Pentecost, which was that fourth of the seven feasts of Israel uh, that they celebrated, Jesus Christ sent back His Spirit. That's the day when the Holy Spirit entered into the disciples who were waiting in the upper room as according to Jesus' instructions and we saw visible manifestations in that event of the indwelling baptism of God the Holy Spirit. And that manifestation we also recognized the wind that came into the room, the rushing winds, but we also saw the flames of fire that uh, lit upon their head and then ultimately rested within them, giving them for the first time a visible manifestation of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. This was a unique event, only happened to them, only happened this one time in all of church age history, again, in all of Bible history, as we know. So now we recognize uh, this little flame that was laid upon, upon their head. And that also brought us back to the understanding of the light that God gave to the people of Israel back in their worship ceremonies in the tabernacle and temple that God had instructed them to build in the worship of Him during their history and throughout their history as we know. And in regard to that, we noted that that flame reminded us of the imagery of the golden candlestick or the golden lampstand, as it's also called, that was built by Israel in, by the instructions of God to be placed in the tabernacle to be the light that shines within that room. And inside that room, we recognize the table of showbread that is across from it, and that represents Jesus Christ as the bread of life. This, too, represents Jesus Christ as the light unto the world. But within this lampstand, we know the cups that are upon it. They fill those cups with oil that are representative of the Word of God that comes into our soul. Then the flame is lit, burning that oil, and the light then shines forward. Therefore, we recognize the imagery of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, coming into our souls, along with the indwelling and filling of God the Holy Spirit to utilize that Word so that we now become the lights unto the world as we spread the gospel message to those far and wide and also in our local area, as we also encourage fellow believers with the Word of God. So that's all the imagery noted and seen in regard to this golden lampstand related back to the Feast of Pentecost when they received the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And we went through all of that doctrine, and I thought, and you probably thought we were done with it. But there is one more aspect to that that I want to share with you today in the imagery and analogy, we also call it typology, that we recognize in regard to the golden uh, lampstand that is found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, and really in, in the entire chapter in verses 1 through 14. We're going to read that in just a minute. <coughs> but also, just to set things up, 
Remember, we studied in the Word of God, the New Testament, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He became light and, uh, again, shined that light onto a lost and dying world as he presented himself as the Savior, recognizing the gospel of Jesus Christ through his perfect work upon the cross. And on that cross, he paid the penalty for our sins so that we would be forgiven of our sins and then therefore have eternal life or salvation also with God. Jesus Christ is the light that has come into the world. But us believers in this age in which we live in, our current uh, generation, <coughs> as we know, we too are called lights of the world. But in recognition of that, we in ourselves are not the light. In our human power, our human resources, and our strength, we are not the light. But it's Jesus Christ who is in us through the power of his word that is in us and the power of the Holy Spirit that is in us that utilizes that word. And when we express that within the mentality of our soul and to those who are out in the world as we witness and give the gospel message, we then therefore are the lights of the world. But we're not the light. It's Jesus in us and the word of God, bi the Bible, as we call it, Bible doctrine as well, that word resonant within our soul that is applied to our life. That is the light that shines forward from us. And in recognition to that, like the golden candlestick, the candlestick represented Jesus Christ in his deity. The cups represented, again, his ministry unto the world that needed to be filled with oil. The oil is the word of God. The oil is then lit, and that gives the light that shines in the dark places. Jesus Christ is the light unto the world, and because of our union with Christ and our relationship with his word, we too then become lights of the world. Not of our own, but because of who and what Jesus Christ is. And that imagery was also given in this Old Testament passage to the Israelites in a unique event that was occurring during their history. And we read about this in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14. And what's interesting, just to set this up a little bit, is that uh, the time frame in which this is uh, written and speaking about was the time frame of after the Babylonian captivity. Remember, the Israelites came under discipline by God. The Babylonians came in, took them over, and then brought them into exile back in Babylon. Seventy years later, they were then given freedom to come back to Israel, and they were given the ability to come back and restore the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonian Empire 70 years prior. And during that time, again, they had some starts and fits in regard to rebuilding that temple. And in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, this is one of the passages and verses where God is now encouraging the people of Israel through two great leaders that God provided for them at that time to finish the building or the rebuilding of the temple there in Jerusalem. And they had started it about uh, uh, you know, uh, several years prior to this time frame, might have been 15, 16 years prior. And again, they had opposition by the local people in regard to building it. So again, it was put off and put off and put off. But God then raised up some individuals, including Zechariah, to write these things, give this encouragement, and then two great leaders we're going to read about where God empowered them to lead the people to rebuild the temple there in Jerusalem, which they did, and they completed the work in regard to uh, what God had commanded them to do. I've given you a little bit more detail than that in the notes. I won't go through all of that today. But I want to get into this passage, and there's a lot of great analogy and understanding in regard to our spiritual life as we go forward with the encouragement that God gives us through his word and by his spirit as well. So let's read about this and see in Zechariah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 14, where we once again have an imagery of the lampstand. And again, this is typology and analogy. This isn't a literal lampstand. It's a typology and analogy of the lampstand that they had in the temple and tabernacle. But yet there were also two other images associated with this and two olive trees. So let's read about that. And then we'll come back and uh, go through some of the detail and understanding of how this has continued to be applicable in our lives today. So in Zechariah chapter 4 in verse 1, it says, The angel of the Lord was speaking with me, returned and roused me as a man who is awakened from his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, 
with its bowl on the top of it. Now, that's something different, that bowl on the top of it. That's different from the lampstand that was in the tabernacle. So we're going to come back to that. It says, and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. And that last part, too, seven spouts on the top of each seven lamps. We're going to come back and talk about that. So that's a little bit different imagery. We have the base imagery of the golden candlestick, as I showed you on the board, but we've got a couple of extra things going on, a bowl above it and then extra piping or uh, uh, spouts, as it were, coming down from the bowl into each individual uh, lamp. Now in verse 3, it says, Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on the left side. Then I answered and said to the angel who was speaking to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of Hosts. And again, you should recognize right away that that's one of the songs that we sing from time to time and one of the famous uh, Christian songs uh, in uh, current uh, uh, Christianity. Now in verse 7 it says, What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now in verse 9 it says, The hands of Zerub Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered the second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me saying, Do you not know what these are? Kind of funny how he goes, Do you not know what these are? <laughs> it's like, in other words, you know, God does that. I'll just pause a little bit and give you a little preach right here. God does that to us sometimes, too. Again, many times we're out there in, in life and all of a sudden a problem or a difficulty comes up. And, you know, God has already given us the solution. Remember, if we're positive towards the word of God and taking it out on a consistent basis, God prepares us for what we're going to face later today, tomorrow, the next day, a week from now and a month from now. And in those times when that situation comes up, God is basically saying to us when we question, God, what's happening? Lord, what, what should I do? What is going on here? Doesn't he say, do you not know what this is? You see, he's already prepared you. And you should have the information at your beckoning call and the mentality of your soul through the power of the Holy Spirit to apply to that thing. But yet, in the grace of God, we always don't get right there. We always don't cut to the chase, as it were. And sometimes we need that little nudging by God once again in the moment to remind us of the Word of God and the power of God to solve the problem, the difficulty, or whatever we may be facing within our lives. So that's kind of going on here, too. Do you not know what this is all about? You know, a lampstand, you see the olive branches, you see the olive trees, you see everything going on. Don't you know what this is all about? And oh, by the way, you're here rebuilding the temple in Israel, in Jerusalem, with all of its articles. Do you not know what this is all about? You see, they should have known, but God is giving them that little nudge. And because they say, no, I don't know, he finally gives the answer. All right. So again, so he answered me, verse 13. Do you not know what these things are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, a lot of imagery going on here, a lot of uh, detail that goes into this. Uh, uh, some things, uh, you know, are, are right on the surface. Other things are a little bit deeper, as I'll explain to you and go through this. But uh, I want to kind of give you a lot of this imagery. But I'm going to start with a couple of things that we've already studied and noted just to bring back the correlations. 
Because when we go back into verse 11, let me read that once again. Verse 11, it says, Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lamp stand and on its left? Okay. Well, when we recognize what's going on here, and actually, I got, I got a wrong verse there. Hold on, hold on. Let me go back. I lost my place. Ah, it should be verse 10, okay? This should be verse 10 up there on the board, typo there. All right, verse 10, let me read that. For who has despised the day of small things, but these, and this is, this is the analogy, these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel, these are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. So again, in this analogy, what we see is these seven eyes that range to and fro throughout the earth. We've already noted in regard to our study of the lampstand and the power of the Holy Spirit in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, and also we see it in 4, 5. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, how these seven eyes represent not individuals and seven different spirits, but the entire ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And the seven is that number of spiritual perfection. So it's talking about the spiritual perfect ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And we also see with the eyes, seeing all, we see the omniscience of God, the all-knowing of God, that he sees all, he knows all, and not only in the moment, but he sees what's coming in the future as well. You see, God knows all things, what happened yesterday, what's happening today, and what's going to happen in the future tomorrow as well. So as we see the correlation in Revelation 5, 6, it says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. That's a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then with that, that lamb itself having seven horns, horns talk about power, spiritual perfect power. And seven eyes, again, the omniscience of God and in relationship to Jesus Christ. But he goes on to say, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And again, there aren't seven spirits, but this is talking about the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit. And remember, Jesus Christ is the one who sent back the Holy Spirit so that we would be empowered for the age in which we live in. And that began on the day of Pentecost with the flame of fire that then set or rested and dwelt amongst them. Now we also compare that with Revelation 4, 5. It says, out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. So again, seven lamps of fire, just like the menorah. Okay, We see the same imagery there, the golden candlestick or the golden lampstand. And it says, which are the seven spirits of God? So again, the seven eyes, the seven horns, the seven spirits, we're all talking about Jesus Christ and now God, the Holy Spirit, working in union and in conjunction to know all, see all, and to empower the believer for the works that we are to be doing. So again, we've noted that. Now in verse 14, when it talks about the two anointed ones, again, notice that they're anointed. Remember we talked about any time there was an anointing, oil was involved. Oil also representing the Holy Spirit, oil representing the Word of God. The two anointed ones, again, anointed by God, which means they had the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, within them. As we talk in the Old Testament, they didn't have the permanent indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, like you and I do, and all believers of the age in which we live in. Only a certain few had the indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit. But the age in which you and I live in, Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ receives that indwelling. So we call the Old Testament saints indwelling, the endowment, just to give it a little bit of differentiation, because it was a little bit different ministry, but it still was an empowering, enabling ministry. And we have Zerubbabel, we've already named him, who is not named here, is the high, pri uh, the high priest called Joshua at this time. So Zerubbabel and Joshua, and you can go back to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, to see that he's the other anointed one. These two individuals, and it's unique why these two individuals. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But these are the two anointed ones, and it represents that they are empowered with God the Holy Spirit. But as we've noted and mentioned already in 1 John chapter 2, you and I are also called the anointed ones. And we have an anointing, which means the indwelling, filling ministry of God the Holy Spirit. 
So again, there's nothing unique about the anointing ministry different from the indwelling. It's just a different way of saying it. So we're anointed. And again, we've been anointed by God the Holy Spirit. We've been baptized by God the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. And we can be filled with God the Holy Spirit as we walk forward positively in the Word of God. So as we see the two olive trees that were around this golden lampstand, we see the first individual being Joshua the high priest. Again, going back to Zechariah chapter one, verse or excuse me, chapter three, verse one. You can read that on your own. And also we see the person named here, the person Zerubbabel. Now, who is Zerubbabel? Well, he was the governor of the city of Jerusalem continuing now to be under the, uh, the, the, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire that was in control at that time. But he was now the designated leader for the political government of Jerusalem and the Israelites at that time. Another thing we could call him, royalty. He was now the king of Israel, as established by the Medo-Persian Empire. He was the ruler over the people and nation of Israel. And he was designated as that ruler to go back and build the temple. And why is that unique? Well, what we see is Joshua, the high priest. Again, this isn't the Joshua of Moses' time. This is a different Joshua, okay? But this Joshua was the high priest at that time. And both of them are types of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is what? Our high priest, and he is our king. He's the high priest, he's the high king. And we recognize that Jesus Christ as the king priest was a unique individual kingship and priesthood. And again, not to burn your brain cells too much, but in the book of Hebrews, according to the order of Melchizedek. He was a unique king priest. And you see that in the book of Hebrews throughout, giving you some of that detail in your notes. But in any case, Jesus Christ in the uniqueness of his rulership and his leadership, he is the king priest as we too now being in union with Jesus Christ, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, 9, we also are called royal priests. And so every believer in the age in which we live in, we are royal ambassadors and we are royal priests unto God. And so when Joshua and Zerubbabel, as the two anointed ones, were raised up by God, meaning they had the power of God the Holy Spirit in them, which the other believers in Israel did not have at that time, Again, other than Zechariah and maybe a few other uh, uh, great prophets at that time. But the general population did not have the power of the Holy Spirit. But these two did. And they were raised up by God to lead, what? The rebuilding of the temple. And again, that just brings us back to the analogy is right now, what are we? First Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6. You are the temple of God. And once we believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells us. We are made to be the temple of God. And then the Father and the, Holy, uh, and the Son also indwell us. And we become the lights of the world. So again, great analogy here. And we're seeing these two individuals being raised up with the power of God, the Holy Spirit, to rebuild the tabernacle. But these two are going to be the shining lights for the people of Israel to encourage them and strengthen them to do that. Because for the past several years, they have been discouraged and they have been thwarted from their attempts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So God is now bringing them together so that ultimately they would lead the people to create the temple, the dwelling place of God, once again. And so as we've noted, ultimately, these two olive trees, we see the pipes coming down from them going into that one bowl that was above the candlestick. They were the supply of the oil coming down as olive trees. Remember, it was olive oil, and the supply was coming down. Well, again, oil represents the Word of God that is resonant within our soul. We're learning about the Word of God today. Hopefully after today, you're going to know all about Zechariah. You're going to know about uh, Zerubbabel. You're going to know about Joshua. You're going to know about the golden candlestick. Now you've got that information to carry with you as you go forward. You see, that's the oil that God gives to us. And that oil is what is supplied for us so that we can go forward in the plan of God. And as we have the pipeline coming down, that's a representation of what we call, and again, without getting into too many uh, uh, terminology and acronyms, the grace apparatus for perfection. And basically, that's God the Holy Spirit teaching us the word. 
because, yeah, my lips are moving right now. You're hearing my voice. But God the Holy Spirit is the one working within you to receive the word and understand that word and make it un- understandable to you. He's the one teaching you, not me. He's the one who taught me so that I could speak this morning, hopefully also through the power of God the Holy Spirit. I shouldn't say hopefully. All right, but in any case, all right? Uh, but <coughs> in any case, we're talking about God's provision to teach us the word of God. The two olive trees and the olive oil is flowing. It's flowing, it's flowing. As God the Holy Spirit teaches us his word so that we too can become the light and shine in dark places. So again, we see that imagery and analogy. Now I'm going to take you through uh, several of the verses and uh, have us uh, understand uh, the different analogy and typology, especially in verse 2, because verse 2 is chock full of uh, uh, information. Uh, So in verse 2 it says, And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on the top of it, and its seven lamps on it, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Okay. Oh, my mic's on. Oh, jeez. My mic's going wild. All right. Let's see if I can get that better. Oh, boy. Hold on. Keep me quiet. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. So... Okay, back in back in style. All right. So, verse two. When we recognize everything that was going on there, again we see the imagery. We've got this bowl on top. We've got uh, seven pipes coming down to each of the seven lamps that are on the golden candlestick, the lampstand, which we also call the menorah today, because that's the Hebrew word uh, for the uh, lampstand. So again, we see great typology here. First is we see the number seven written throughout this, okay? We have seven lamps, and there's seven pipes coming into each of the lamps, supplying them with oil. All of that is talking about is the spiritual perfection of this process. Again, seven is the number of spiritual perfection throughout the Bible. It's talking about God's plan to fill us up with the Word of God, and it's a perfect plan so that we can live the spiritual life uh, unto God perfectly as well. That doesn't mean we're not going to fail. It doesn't mean we're not going to sin from time to time. But we have the ability and the uh, resources necessary so that we can fulfill God's plan for our lives. So again, the number seven is speaking about the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit so that we can learn the Word of God and be the light of Christ unto the world. Then we also see the one bowl that's above it. And again, that's unique. They didn't have that in the temple, okay? This is unique to this imagery. One bowl up above, and the oil is flowing into that bowl. Basically, it's talking about the oneness of who God is. And that reminds us when we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. One God, one faith, one baptism. We have one Lord, and there is one God, the Holy Spirit. And so we recognize the oneness, the the unity of the Trinity, and also the oneness of the whole plan of God that works within our lives. So again, it's all coming down into one bowl. And everything that God does in his oneness, again, three God, uh, three persons in one God, okay, the oneness of God gives us the strength and power, the resources necessary to fulfill his plan for our lives so that we can be the lights unto the world. So again, we see this in this imagery that is given. And so then the menorah, okay, the golden lampstand that was in the tabernacle and the temple, remember it too had the seven lamps above it. Again, you had the main branch coming up and then three branches going to each side. Three and three is six, and then the one main one, that made seven. We talked about that analogy prior. So we see those seven branches coming up. 
and we see the bowls that held the oil on that lampstand. And that, too, all representing the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, based on what? The person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ is the lampstand, and it was made of pure gold. They talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. There was no wood involved in this. And it wasn't, you know, in, in this imagery, again, wood representing his humanity, gold representing his deity. Here we see the perfect plan of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, to provide us the resources necessary so that we can be the lights unto the world. And he provided us the oil, again, the word of God, and he provided us the, the flame, God the Holy Spirit, so that ultimately we can be that great light. Number four is that each cup had seven supply tubes coming down from the one bowl. And so again, the one bowl filled up with all the oil, the word of God that was necessary. Now from there, it flowed down into each individual life. And again, representing how the word of God comes into each individual uh, believer throughout our age and was working for them back then as well. The perfect plan of God in the grace apparatus for perception, the teaching ministry of God the Holy Spirit. We see the seven pipes supplying each of the seven lamps. Again, each one having seven. Spiritual perfection upon spiritual perfection. So we see that in detail as we go throughout. The seven lamps were the seven spouts or pipes, as it were. The Hebrew word is uh, mutsaka, as it says. And again, a pipeline or a casted pipe, as it were, in the Hebrew language, I should say. Basically, again, the word of God coming into our soul. God's grace plan coming down for each and every one of us. And then what we see in imagery here is that we have seven lamps with seven pipes. So you do the math. Seven times seven, it gets you to the number 49. What does that remind you of? The Feast of Pentecost. Remember, from the Feast of First Fruits, they had to count seven weeks, and then on the next day was the Feast of Pentecost. That's when they received God the Holy Spirit. So that imagery is given to us here as well, so that we recognize what God is telling us. This is all about the power of the Holy Spirit coming into us as not only given to Zerubbabel and Joshua to fulfill the task of rebuilding the temple, but also... The book of Zechariah is all great prophecy of the coming of Christ who then would send his spirit that then would begin the age in which we live in and the power of God, the Holy Spirit that we now have that began on that Feast of Pentecost about 2,000 years ago. So again, in numerology, we even see the spiritual perfection coming down to the giving of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, as we go into verse 3, let's read that. It says, also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and one uh, or the other on its left side. So what we recognize here is that these two olive trees were sources for fuel for the lamp. Again, the olive trees provided the olives and again flowed down the olive oil from them. This is kind of interesting. Now, there's a dual connotation here, and again, I... I yeah, get to it here in verse 3, but in the last uh, two uh, verses, in verses 11 through 14, it comes back around again, and we see a little bit more detail. And we'll talk uh, maybe a little bit about it then as well. But we have a double imagery going on here. You have two men, again, the king and the priest, representing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in typology as our king and priest, but yet we see two men. We see two members of the human race supplying the all olive oil down. Well, again, we go back to the original. It's the mind of Christ, the word of God, as they represent Christ collectively when we bring the two together in the ministry of Jesus Christ, but yet they're members of the human race. And so the imagery comes forward that not o what we talk about is Jesus Christ as the light unto the world. We talk about his word being the mind of Jesus Christ, and we talk about the Holy Spirit who works within each and every one of us so that we can learn and then apply that word. And when we have the imagery of these two men here, first and foremost, it was to encourage and lead the Israelites to rebuild the temple, as they were discouraged, as I've already said. They needed to go out and give the word. They needed to encourage. They needed to teach. But again, it wasn't from their own human resources, their own human power. Again, not by, might, uh, by, by my might or power, but by the power of the Lord. We have to remember that. 
But yet God used these two individuals. Just as God wants to use you as an individual believer to be filled with the oil of the word of God so that what? You can supply to other people as well. Now we've got a priest. We can talk about the pastor teacher. The pastor teacher teaches the word. But we also have a king. The king typically wasn't the teacher of the word of God. He was more of an administrator, as it were. And you and I, as you know, as I've already said, we are royal ambassadors and we are royal priests. We are royalty. Jesus is the capital K, we're the lowercase k. But the fact is what's going on here is that God wants to teach us so that we can teach others. And that's why we're here. We're here to fill ourselves up so that we can be encouraged and have the inner joy and peace and happiness of God within our heart on a consistent basis. As we're going to see in just a minute, he takes the mountains and he can flatten them into a plain field so that we can overcome the problems of life. Yes, the word of God is for you individually. But more importantly, it's for us to then relate to other people give the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people, to encourage them, strengthen them, lift them up, help them, especially our fellow believers who may be in a reversionistic or a wayward motion. Get them back into the word of God. Encourage them to continue their spiritual walk. And for the unbelievers of the world, to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because without that, they can do nothing in the spiritual life. But once they believe upon the gospel, now they too become lights of the world, and the whole realm of the word of God opens up to them. And all that oil of the word of God can now flow into their soul as well. So again, this is a great double imagery, not only of Christ, which is the basis of all of this and why we're able to do it, but the two individuals that God raised up as he's now raising you up to teach and preach the word of God on a consistent basis in whatever capacity that he leads you to, whether it be a quiet whisper in a corner with a friend on a, you know, on a Saturday night, or whether it be on a street corner screaming your head off, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Okay, don't get too ridiculous. All right. But, but, yeah, <laughs> but whatever it is, however God leads you, he raises us up. And he gives us the power and the strength and the resources, the word of God and the Holy Spirit, so that we can do those things. Now in verse 6, we'll see how much of this I wanted to get all this in. I don't know if I'll get it all in today, but I'm trying. Now in verse 6 it says, When he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So what do we recognize? It's not my personality. It's not my good looks. Nope, it's, a <laughs> it's not my iPhone. It's, a <laughs> it's not any strength or power or riches or resources that I have. It's none of that. Okay? That happens all the time. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not by any resource of power that we have in our flesh, but it's by His power, by His might, that we can be overcomers that we can learn the Word of God and teach and preach the Word of God. And again, a great passage and again, a great song that we sing. Not by my might, but about my power, but by the power of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord of hosts. So again, we see the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And we need to allow that power to work within us. And that's why, again, as George did in our prayer, we confess our sins and have the cleansing of all unrighteousness, as it says in 1 John 1, 9. And with the cleansed vessel, now the Holy Spirit is working within us. You see, when we sin, now sin is working within us, and we damper the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But once we confess that sin, we are renewed and refreshed. And now the power of God can work within us, and that's how we be a light unto the world. That's how we learn and then teach and preach. Now in verse 7, and again, this is a fantastic analogy as well. As it says, what are you, O great mountain? Now, first and foremost, it's talking about the project of rebuilding the temple. Again, it took years to build that the first time. And they tried. They laid the foundation. They put up an altar. And that's as far as they got. They didn't build the rest of the building. And it became an insurmountable task for them. 
And there was a lot of opposition. You can read about that in other passages throughout the Old Testament. A lot of opposition to thwart their efforts to rebuild that. And, then, and so it became a mountain in their minds, something that is insurmountable or something that can't be overcome. And so he says, what is, the, what is this mountain? Again, verse 7. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So in other words, you know, we talk about making a mountain out of a molehill, okay? You see, in God's eyes, every problem, every difficulty, everything that we face is really, and and I even hate to say a molehill, because what we just read, it's a flat plain, (laughs) okay? It's really nothing to God. He's the all-powerful, all-knowing God. And there is no problem in our life that he has not seen and has not given you the answer for and that he cannot overcome in your life, in the mentality of your soul and in your daily walk. There's no mountain. There's no problem. There's no thing that is insurmountable to God. This rebuilding the temple, oh, we can't do that. It's too big of a project. Can't do it. What is this? It's a little nothing. It's not a mountain. It's a plain field. And you can just walk and go forward. You walk casually. Again, when you climb a mountain, you're struggling. I mean, I just came from the mountains. You can't breathe up in those mountains, okay? You can't breathe up there. But when you're on sea level in the flat plain, it's an easy stroll down the park. Easy stroll down the park. And that's what God is saying to them about the rebuilding of the temple that seemed like a mountain that they could, uh, they could easily overcome. And he says the same thing for us when we have the word of God, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. There is nothing and no obstacle that we can't overcome. And to borrow a, uh, a saying that uh, we posted in our uh, uh, ministry, uh, uh, Facebook ministry this past week, God did not remove the obstacle of the Red Sea for the Israelites when they faced it, did he? No, the Red Sea was still there. What did he do? He parted the waters. The sea remained. He didn't take the sea away. In other words, the problem remained. But what did he do? He gave them safe passage through. So they could easily walk through the Red Sea. And that's the same for you and I in our daily lives. We think it, we see things, as I said time and time again, the news and You know, the uh, airways are trying to fill your head up with mountains that are insurmountable for you to overcome, okay? But you can go right through those mountains. You can cut a path straight through through the power of God working in your soul. And God, as we see, and again, running out of time here, so um, I'll uh, get uh, close to the wrapping up portion. But as we recognize, God wants us to be overcomers in this life. I want you to be an overcomer. What does that mean? The mountain becomes a flat plain for you. But yet, in the mentality of our soul, if we don't let God deal with the mountain through his word that he's given to us and pray and trust that he's going to see and guide us through, the mountain will not go away because we are not faithful and trusting in God. But when we see the mountain as God sees the mountain, as a flat plain, something that is easily overcome, then we too will walk as an overcomer. We too will trust and rely and apply his word through the power of God the Holy Spirit within us so that it is not a problem at all. And just think about our all-powerful, all-knowing God. And then we think about the problems of this life. Again, we also in Denver visited the uh, the uh, Natural Museum while we were there. We went to a planetarium uh, um, uh, uh, little video, okay? Saw our solar system and zipping through that. I love that thing, okay? The solar system's this big, and we're a planet about that big in the solar system, and we're about a that big on that planet within that solar system. And that solar system then is part of a galaxy that is like the pizza I ate, ginormous. <laughs> you all know the inside Facebook thing. And that's one galaxy amongst hundreds of thousands, if not millions, within the heavens that we know. Do you think God can overcome the problems in your life? Yes, he can. 
But if you don't turn it over to him and trust and be faithfully walking, receiving his word and then applying that in prayer as well, it's not going to happen. But with the power of God, he's telling us the mountain can become a plain. We can go through it and walk through it and be victorious each and every day. And then the last aspect in regard to this, and this is where I'll leave it, and we'll have to finish the rest of this on Tuesday uh, night, is that as they go through this mountain that has now become a flat plain, he's saying Zerubbabel is going to put the capstone on top. He's going to put the root stone. He's going to finish this project, which he started when they came back from exile years ago. He's going to finish it. And he's not just going to finish it and say, okay, we're done. No, with great joy, shouts of triumph. And in Ezra chapter 3, verse 11, and the rest of that uh, passage, we see how they did celebrate the completion of that temple with shouts of joy. And that's the same for you and I in our life. You see, you're not just going to get through the problem. You're not just going to make it, okay? Oh, I made it. Whew. Okay? No. You're going to go through it and say, that was awesome. And God was with me. And I see his power. I see his strength even more so now. And I am rejoicing inside. And now I'm going to rejoice outside and praise my Lord for what he has done within my life. So again, being an overcomer doesn't mean you just make it. Okay? It means you are victorious and you have conquered. And again, not you, but the Word of God and the Holy Spirit within you that brings you joy and excitement and exhilaration. And you may want to keep it to yourself, but God's saying share it with others. Grace, grace unto you. The grace of God has made all this possible. He's given us the grace pipeline so that we could receive the Word of God through the grace apparatus for perception. He's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to apply that. He gets all the credit, and we rejoice. So again, as we come back on Tuesday, we're going to see a few more analogies as we go through this golden lampstand analogy back in the day of the rebuilding of the temple uh, as they came out of exile. But the fact of the matter is, God's got a perfect plan. He's got a perfect plan and a perfect method and process to teach you and to strengthen you and to encourage you each and every day so that you too can be an overcomer with great rejoicing and joy inward that then can be expressed outward, especially to God in our praise. All right, so let's close there. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your uh, great object lessons that you've given to us in Old and New Testament so that we can see in the mind's eye how the power of the word and the Holy Spirit work based on the ministry of Jesus Christ also being within our lives. So the Father, we can't thank you enough for the perfect ministry of our Lord and also the Holy Spirit that you have provided for us with the word so that we go forward to glorify you to a maximum, being lights unto the world. And Father, we just ask that you increase our faith, increase our knowledge of your word, and increase the power of the Holy Spirit within us so that we can apply that word consistently as we walk faithfully inside your plan. Father, we thank you for this time. In Christ's precious name, amen. All right, thank you very much.